gas to some people is mysterious and even terrifying. Actually, the more you know about gas, the less reason you have to fear it. It's just another weapon. In the case of gas, every soldier has very efficient armor plating in his gas equipment. Various special troops, such as stretcher bearers, have additional equipment, as they may have to work for a considerable time in an area contaminated with liquid blister gas. That's all very nice for the stretcher bearer, but it's no good unless he can use it efficiently. If he can't, he may become a casualty himself. Stretcher bearers, for example, have the usual respirator, eye shields, ointment, and cotton waste. But the cape is modified, and in addition, he has gloves and overboots. The cape differs from the ordinary cape in that it has two pairs of press studs, which enable the points of the cape to be fixed between the legs to form a loose trouser effect. This gives protection to the legs and knees when kneeling. Overboots are worn over ordinary boots and fastened with a whip cord round the knees and with straps round the ankles. Overboots can be improvised from sandbags or sacking. The degree of protection depends on the number of thicknesses of material. For example, boots can be further reinforced with a sandbag tied round the feet. But the first line of defense is well dubbed boots. Kneeling becomes much safer if the knees are protected in the same way. There are gloves to protect the stretcher bearer's hands. They are kept in place by quick release straps, but you must know which strap to pull. The tab on the outer side of the wrist, that's the side of your little finger, is the one that tightens the strap, and you should also see that the straps run freely, like this. If you know you're going to work in blister vapor for a long time, put a handkerchief round your neck inside the collar. Also, turn in the cuffs of the battle dress blouse. This stops the vapor getting in under your clothing. AB battle dress destroys blister vapor before it can get through it to damage the skin. Gloves may not always be available, so ointment must be applied to the exposed parts of the body. It must be rubbed in hard for a full half minute. Remember that the tube doesn't open like toothpaste by unscrewing the top, but by tearing off the bottom. Squeeze out some ointment and rub it in hard for 30 seconds on each part of the exposed skin. Half a minute on the hands. Half a minute on the neck and ears. To make you realize just how long this is, we'll show you 30 seconds on the screen. Starting now. Use enough of the ointment so that a thin film is left when you've finished. Rub vigorously on the wrists and between the fingers. It doesn't work properly unless you rub it in hard. At the third stroke, it will be half a minute or 30 seconds precisely. Wait for it. Now as to the preparation of the stretcher. Two blankets and a cover are usual, but not essential. So we have a stretcher, number one blanket, the stretcher cover made of specially treated and toughened paper, and number two blanket. When the stretcher is prepared like this, it can be used for contaminated or non-contaminated cases, even if the stretcher and number one blanket get contaminated. If there's a shortage of blankets or covers, use gas capes instead. The number one blanket is folded in three lengthways. Fold over the head end, making a pillow, so that this number one blanket is now just the length of the stretcher canvas. The cover is supplied to the unit in rolls, so cut it up into lengths slightly longer than the stretcher canvas, and for each new casualty, use a new length of cover on top of the number one blanket. In actual practice, these lengths should be cut off in readiness long before they're required. Number two blanket is folded inwards towards the center and then in half twice. It's placed at the head end of the stretcher and then rolled up with the cover by number two bearer. Number one blanket is rolled separately by number one bearer. Always roll up from head to feet 
and put the bundles in the stretcher in the usual way. So even if the stretcher and the number one blanket are contaminated, given a clean number two blanket and a cover to protect it, the stretcher can be used for a clean casualty. So much for the preparation of the stretcher. Now for the use of the stretcher. Often it'll be difficult to decide whether your casualty is contaminated or not. So apply a preventative dose of ointment to your hands in any case. Blister gas is a liquid. Usually it looks like dirty car oil, but it may be clear like liquid paraffin. The liquid rapidly sinks into clothes, like water into blotting paper, and it's just as difficult to see, especially, of course, in the dark. Whether the casualty is clean or dirty, speed in removal from the danger area is the important factor. Whether the stretcher is clean or dirty, keep it off the ground until it's been opened. By holding it at opposite corners with the right hand, it's easily turned over whilst the bundles are removed with the left hand. But remember, the cover and number two blanket must be clean. Always unroll the bundles from the foot of the stretcher towards the head. Number two bearer puts number two blanket at the head of the stretcher. This holds down the head of the cover. If the wind is blowing up the foot of the cover, tear holes in the cover and slip it over the stretcher handles. Number two is now free to help number one, who always makes straight for the casualty's wound. Arresting hemorrhage, treating the wound, and preventing shock are always the stretcher bearer's first concern. Number two may swab away any obvious liquid blister gas from the casualty's skin, but no attempt is made to undress him. The bearer's hands are, of course, protected by ointment. If the casualty's condition allows it, lift him by the ankles and webbing braces sideways onto the stretcher. By this method, you're less likely to get yourself contaminated from his clothes. Once the casualty is on the stretcher, spread out number two blanket on top of him and tuck in its edges underneath him. Pull up his haversack to form a pillow and remove his cape. The cape will give additional protection against the weather or a spray attack. Always, before and after working with contaminated material, apply ointment to your hands. And only when carrying a stretcher do you put on the oilskin gloves. Before lifting a stretcher, tuck in the back of your cape or it may brush over the casualty's face. And so the journey of evacuation begins. Carrying a loaded stretcher is hot work when you're wearing protective clothing and a respirator. At the earliest opportunity, test for gas. Gas clear. Helmet back. Face piece off. Eye shields on. Helmet on. And put the face piece away in the haversack. The best way of getting off a casualty's face piece is to pull his steel helmet forwards over the connecting tube. And don't forget to put on his eye shields, as in case of a spray attack, there's an increased risk of the drops entering his eyes, lying as he does face upwards. Eye shields also protect the casualty's eyes from the cape of a careless stretcher bearer who omits to tuck in the bottom of his cape. Just watch this. Sometimes it may be possible to bring the ambulance car right up to the area where the casualties fell on the contaminated ground. Again, speed in removal is essential, but nothing contaminated must touch the interior of the ambulance. To prevent their boots from picking up contamination from the ground, the car order is put on over boots. These may have been contaminated last time they were worn, so don't let them touch the floor of the ambulance, but rest them on the step. This also may be contaminated, so don't stand on it unless you're wearing over boots. The driver, too, puts on overboots before his feet touch the ground. Clean stretchers only may be put in ambulance cars, so protect the stretcher by putting it on a clean cover beside the casualty. Prepare the stretcher in the usual way before putting it into the ambulance. The cover on the ground may be used for nearby cases in the same way, but it must never be put into the ambulance as it is contaminated.
the bearer's overboots are removed on the top step as they must not be allowed inside the ambulance. Join the boots together by their whip cords. Pass the loop through the window and slip it over a screw inside. Naturally, they all apply ointment to their hands. Very little liquid gas in a confined space can give rise to a dangerous vapor concentration. And remember, your casualty has not yet been decontaminated. So open the windows and the front door, and the fresh air will minimize the vapor danger on the journey. On clean ground, this is how an ambulance car can take aboard a contaminated casualty from a contaminated stretcher. There's no need for the car orderlies to wear over boots, but they must not stand on the contaminated step, and they avoid touching the bearer's clothing as far as possible. Contaminated stretchers must not be placed inside the ambulance car, so the casualty is changed over to a clean stretcher. This is placed beside the contaminated stretcher and prepared in the usual way. The clean number two blanket is returned to the ambulance. Transfer the casualty on the contaminated cover and roll in the edges to prevent them touching the interior of the ambulance. Supply the bearers with a clean cover and number two blanket. As they've kept their contaminated number one blanket, this makes their set complete and ready for the next casualty. Contaminated overboots may also be carried in the stretcher. They all apply another dose of ointment. Mind that contaminated step. And get the casualty away to the RAP. The bearers are free to go for another case. Always remember that your respirator and ointment are the two first lines of defense. But the ointment, good as it is, is only effective if rubbed in hard for the full half minute. Decontamination of stretchers in the field is difficult, so keep the number two blanket protected by the cover. And don't allow anything contaminated to touch the interior of an ambulance. Concentrate on speed of evacuation rather than decontamination. Better the blistered living than the decontaminated dead. <laughs>